most dangerous giants in the Bible. Number 1. Og, King of Bashan Og, King of Bashan, was a mighty and infamous Amorite King of Bashan, who reigned at Ashtaroth during Moses' time and fought the Israelites on their way back to the Promised Land. God granted the Israelites victory over King Og's forces, and Moses and the Israelites captured Bashan, a fertile land east of the Jordan River. Because of Og's terrifying strength and the Israelite forces' relative inexperience, the victory was significant. Leading up to the Israelites' encounter with Og, king of Bashan, was a battle with another Amorite king, Sion. Moses had asked Sion to allow the Israelites to pass through his land, promising not to take any of the Amorites' resources along the way. But Sihon instead gathered his forces and attacked the Israelites. God helped Moses and the Israelites defeat the Amorites and take their land. Numbers 21 verses 33 to 35, Amplified Bible. Then they turned and went up by the way of Bashan, and Og the king of Bashan went out against them, he and all his people, to the battle of Adre. But the Lord said to Moses, do not fear him, for I have handed over him and all his people and his land to you, and you shall do to him just as you did to Sihon king of the Amorites, who lived at Heshbon. So the sons of Israel killed Og and his sons and all his people until there was no survivor left to him, and they all took possession of his land. We read, Og king of Bashan went out against them. This was another battle that Israel did not initiate. Yet Israel was more than up to the challenge, and through their God, they won a glorious victory. Do not fear him, for I have delivered him into your hand. This was needed encouragement, because Og of Bashan was noted for his size and strength. Og was yet another Amorite king who was not a threat to Israel because the Lord had already given him and his domain to Israel. The outcome of Og's fight was already predetermined before he had even put on his armor. The battle between Og's forces and Moses' forces is described in Deuteronomy. According to the text, Og ruled over 60 fortified cities, all of which were conquered by the Israelites. This gave Israel more territory to occupy on the east side of the Jordan River and it demonstrated to them that they could overcome the mighty enemies they would face on the west side of the Jordan River through the power of God. Deuteronomy 3 verses 3 to 7 So the Lord our God also gave into our hands Og, king of Bashan, and all his army. We struck them down, leaving no survivors. At that time we took all his cities, there was not one of the sixty cities that we did not take from them. The whole region of Argob, Og's kingdom in Bashan, all these cities were fortified with high walls and with gates and bars, and there were also a great many unwalled villages. We completely destroyed them, as we had done with Sihon, king of Heshbon, destroying every city, men, women, and children. But all the livestock and the plunder from their cities we carried off for ourselves. Like Sihon, Og led his entire army into battle against Israel. And in the case of Sihon, God had already decided to hand over the king, along with his whole army and land, to Israel. Israel destroyed the entire population and took control of all sixty cities in Og's kingdom, which had the same high walls as Sihon. When God chose to hand over an enemy to his people, even strong fortified cities were no match for the enemy. In the future, when they arrive in Jericho, the most striking illustration of that reality would take place there. He was also a huge man with an iron bed that was 9 cubits long and 4 cubits wide, 13.5 feet long and 6 feet wide. The inclusion of this detail highlights Og's size. A man needing this size bed was most likely tall, 10 or 11 feet. Israel triumphed against Sion and Og and took control of their extensive lands on the east bank of the Jordan River after they were vanquished. 
It was obvious that Og was not a weak ruler. Israel does not have any reason to be anxious regarding the size of its opponents. All that was required of them was to recall how powerful their God was. Deuteronomy 3 verse 11, Amplified Bible For only Og king of Bashan was left of the remnant of the giants known as the Rephaim. Behold, his bed frame was a bed frame of iron. Is it not in rubber of the Amorites? It was nine cubits, twelve feet long, and four cubits, six feet wide. Using the cubit of a man, the forearm to the end of the middle finger. His colossal bed had become famous, and no doubt had been saved as a memento. The news of the victory spread quickly, instilling fear in the hearts of those in Canaan. Rahab, a Jericho prostitute, believed the Lord had power even over that heavily fortified city because she and others had heard of the victory over Sion and Og. Joshua 2 verse 10, Amplified Bible For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan on the east, to Sion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. Joshua 9 verses 9 to 10, Amplified Bible They said to him, Your servants have come from a country that is very far away, because of the fame of the Lord your God. For we have heard the news about him, and all the remarkable things that he did in Egypt, and everything that he did to the two kings of the Amorites, who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion, the king of Heshbon, and to Og, the king of Bashan, who lived in Ashtaroth. Moses used the victory to encourage the Israelites as he left them in charge of Joshua and about to enter Canaan. Deuteronomy 31 verse 4 Psalm 135 verses 7 to 11 Who causes the vapors to arise from the ends of the earth? Who makes lightnings for the rain? Who brings the wind out of his storehouses? Who smote the firstborn of Egypt, both of man and beast? Who sent signs and wonders into the midst of you, O Egypt, upon Pharaoh and all his servants? Who smote nations, many and great, and slew mighty kings, Sion, king of the Amorites, Og, king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan? Psalm 136, verses 18 to 20. And slew famous kings, for his mercy and loving kindness endure for Ever Sihon king of the Amorites, for his mercy and loving kindness endure forever, and Og king of Bashan, for his mercy and loving kindness endure forever. According to Deuteronomy 3 verse 11, Og was an offspring of the Raphites, indicating a man of great stature or giant. Joshua 12 verse 4, Amplified Bible, and the territory of Og king of Bashan one of the remnant of the Rephaim, who lived at Ashtaroth and at Adre. Og is referred to as the last of the Rephaim in Deuteronomy 3 verse 11, and later in the books of Numbers and Joshua. Rephaim is a Hebrew word for giants. The Rephates or Rephaim were a people who lived in Canaan and elsewhere during Moses and Joshua's time. The term Rephates is descriptive, not an ethnic one. It means terrible ones. The Rephaim were battle-hardened giants. When the Israelites first attempted to enter the Promised Land, spies reported that it was inhabited by giants known as Nephilim and sons of Anak. The repeated references to the Rephaim in these first three chapters demonstrate that Israel, when trusting in God, was more than capable of defeating this fearsome warrior race. It also demonstrates that their fear of these men was unfounded in Numbers 13 when they refused to enter the Promised Land. Their excuses are shown to be weaker in the light of the next generation's victories. Nothing is too difficult for God. Nothing is impossible for Him. Matthew 19 verse 26 But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Number 2. Goliath 
Goliath was a Philistine giant. The Philistines are the Israelites' foes, and they were gathered for a war at this time. It wasn't long ago that the Philistines were thoroughly beaten, but now they're making a comeback. They descended on Israelite territory and appeared to have taken possession of some of it as they camped in a Judah-controlled area. 1 Samuel 17 verses 1 to 3 Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle and were assembled at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and they camped between Soko and Azekar in Ephestimim. Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they camped in the valley of Elah, and assembled in battle formation to meet the Philistines. The Philistines were standing on the mountain on one side, and Israel was standing on the mountain on the other side, with the valley between them. The valley of Elah was more like a large canyon than a tiny valley. 1 Samuel 17 verse 4, Amplified Bible then a champion came out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. We don't understand precisely what that information means at face value because we don't measure things by cubit or a span, and we count them by feet and inches. So let's put it in terms we can understand. Goliath was a huge man, standing probably around nine feet nine inches tall, and if you add to his height the length of his arms when he would lift them up over his head, you can imagine what an imposing creature he must have been. But it wasn't just his size. 1 Samuel 17 verses 5 to 7, Amplified Bible. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he wore a coat of scale armor overlapping metal plates, which weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had bronze shin protectors on his legs, and a bronze javelin hung between his shoulders. The wooden shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. The blade head of his spear weighed 600 shekels of iron, and a shield bearer walked in front of him. He was dressed in what we'd call a mail coat. The Philistines would get themselves ready for battle by donning a huge undergarment that resembled canvas and was covered in overlapping rings of bronze. This coat of mail shielded the wearer from the shoulders all the way down to the knees from the weapons used by the adversary. This particular style and size of body armor weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze, which is equivalent to between 175 and 200 pounds in modern standards. Goliath was armed with a bronze helmet bronze leggings, greaves, to protect his shins, and a bronze javelin, or spear, slung between his shoulders. These items were all made of bronze. Just the head of his spear was made of iron and weighed 600 shekels, which is around 20 to 25 pounds. According to the report that was written, he was accompanied by a shield carrier who walked in front of him. The Hebrew word that is being used here refers to the largest shield used in battle, which is large enough to protect a grown adult. It is very clear that its purpose was to protect his body from arrows fired by the enemy. So in addition to his body armor, Goliath had this guy racing in front of him, wielding a man-sized shield for further defense. Take a pause and allow your mind to imagine the impressive scene that you had just read about. Imagine the terror that you would feel if you had to face off against a behemoth of this size who was also protected by this much armor. Undoubtedly, the odds are stacked against anyone foolish enough to face him in battle. Notice what this giant warrior did. 1 Samuel 17 verses 8 to 9, Amplified Bible. Goliath stood and shouted to the battle lines of Israel, saying to them, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not the Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will become your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our servants and serve us. 1 Samuel 17, verses 10 to 16, Amplified Bible. Again, the Philistine said, 
I defy the battle lines of Israel this day. Give me a man so that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of that Aphrathite of Bethlehem in Judah, named Jesse, who had eight sons. Jesse was old in the days of Saul, advanced in years among men. His three older sons had followed Saul into battle. The name of his three sons who went into battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next, Abinadab, and third, Shammah. David was the youngest. Now the three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's flock at Bethlehem. The Philistine, Goliath, came out morning and evening and took his stand for 40 days. Goliath suggested a strategy popular in Eastern civilization, namely representative combat or a one-on-one -on -one conflict. He'd be the Philistines' army's representative, while Israel's choice would be the Israelite army's representative. Whoever won, his army was victorious, and whoever lost, his whole army lost. Over the course of a good month and a half, he paraded out there every morning and evening, boasting about his size and his power and daring anyone to fight him. A young boy by the name of David was watching over his father's flock of sheep at that time, and he was doing so in the small town of Bethlehem, which is located in the Judean mountains. He was a long way off from becoming old enough to join the military. In point of fact, David most likely was not aware of the situation that existed between the Israelites and the Philistines at the time. It's possible that he hasn't even heard of Goliath. His only knowledge was that his three oldest brothers were serving in Saul's army, so he called David to run an errand. 1 Samuel 17 verses 17 to 18, Amplified Bible. Then Jesse said to David his son, Take for your brothers an ephah of this roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread, and run quickly to the camp to your brothers. Also, take these ten cuts of cheese to the commander of the unit. See how your brothers are doing and bring back news of them. David had no intention of fighting. His father had just dispatched him to bring his brothers some refreshments and let them know that he was concerned about them. The sun rose like any other morning that day for both David and Goliath. There was no warning, but in reality, Goliath's 41st morning challenge would be his last and David's heroic life would begin. David got up early the following day and did precisely what his father had advised him to do. He left his flock of sheep with another shepherd. Then, as he approaches the outskirts of the Israelite camp, he notices the troops preparing for battle and hears the war cry. He simply wishes to observe what occurs. Then David hurried to the fighting line and entered to greet his brothers, leaving the luggage in the care of the baggage keeper. Consider the circumstances. While standing there with his three brothers, David hears a loud cry from across the valley, and then everyone in his immediate vicinity starts racing to the back and crawling inside their tents. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. 1 Samuel 17 verse 24 Recall that David has never witnessed or heard this Gath giant's challenge. He sees a giant of a man wrapped in armor, screaming threats and defiance and cursing the God of Israel as he looks across the battlefield. Remember now, this is the 41st day the Israelites have encountered Goliath, but this is the first time it's happened to David. 1 Samuel 17 verses 26 to 27, Amplified Bible. Then David spoke to the men who were standing by him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes the disgrace of his taunting from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he has taunted and defied the armies of the living God? The men told him, that is what will be done for the man who kills him. Saul had developed a scheme to entice the giant to die. The problem was that he was the only man in Israel's camp who was capable of fighting Goliath. He was head and shoulders above everyone else, and he was the people's leader. 
Saul devised a strategy that would, ideally, pull someone else into the fray. He promised the fellow who killed Goliath a large reward as well as his daughter's hand in marriage and an exemption from paying taxes on his father's house. A bride, vast wealth, and a tax-free life don't seem so horrible, do they? Even yet, it wasn't enough to elicit a volunteer. The people in David's immediate vicinity informed him about the incentive strategy, which included a variety of external motivations. So here's David, dressed in his most basic shepherd garb and armed with his most basic shepherd weapons, his sling and staff, ready to fight. Then there's the turning point. 1 Samuel 17, verses 41 to 46, Amplified Bible. The Philistine came out and approached David with his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked around and saw David, he derided and disparaged him because he was just a young man with a ruddy complexion and a handsome appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you have come to me with shepherd's staffs? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine also said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. And I will give the corpses of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Imagine the possibilities. David stood unfazed in front of this massive creature. All David had was a sling and a stone against a giant wearing 200 pounds of armor. One stone shot through the air, and that was the end of it. Goliath was crushed like a bag of rocks. 1 Samuel 17, verses 47 to 51, Amplified Bible. And that this entire assembly may know that the Lord does not save with the sword or with the spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will hand you over to us. When the Philistine rose and came forward to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand into his bag and took out a stone and slung it, and it struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone penetrated his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and he struck down the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in David's hand. So he ran and stood over the Philistine, grasped his sword and drew it out its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their mighty champion was dead, they fled. After that, the Philistines didn't hang around. They split the scene when they realized their champion was dead. After that, David brought the head of the Philistine to Jerusalem. When it came to Goliath's weaponry, David had to use Goliath's own sword to slay him. The narrator says that the hero stowed his weapon inside of his tent. They just remained there still, like trophies. This pivotal conflict between giants teaches us four things. Number one, facing giants is an intimidating experience. With perfect perspective and a safe distance of thousands of years, we can look back on Moses and David's daring and victory. Consider, however, even with the eyes of faith, what it would be like to be confronted by the intimidating presence of that brute. David, however, asserted that, my God is greater than he. Number two, you have to go into the fight. No one else can fight for you. Your og is your og, your giant is your giant, and your Goliath is your Goliath. Ah, don't worry about it, someone else would reply. But it's a Goliath to you. Nobody else, not even an advisor or a pastor, not even a parent or a friend can fight him for you. Number three, 
Trusting God provides a sense of security. Moses and the Israelites defeated Og. Their trust in God served as a source of stability in their lives. When you have spent a significant amount of time on your knees, it is surprising how stable you can become. However, if you try to defeat the giant in person, you will be unsuccessful. Number 4. Acquiring victories is an experience that will stick with you. We are expected to think back on the successes we have had in the past. It is expected of us to share our lion and bear stories as well as our personal Goliath victories. Perhaps you don't know what lies across the valley. Maybe you have no idea what that giant is, but it's there, haunting you. That uncertainty alone is enormous, but when compared to the Lord God himself, say with faith, the battle is yours, Lord. It is your fight. I rely on you. I surrender all of my weapons and abilities to you, and I stand before you, trusting you. God sees our need to trust him, and his love is so great that he will not let us go another day without surrendering our fears, worries, and even confusion to him, so that nothing becomes more important to us than our Father. Never ever forget, the battle belongs to the Lord.